Hey, thank you for checking out the Eat Local New York podcast, whether you're watching this on YouTube or through our website at eatlocalnewyork.com. Thank you for checking it out. I'm excited to put this episode out because Phil is possibly doing something really interesting in the local food service scene here in central new york in syracuse and you'll hear more about that in our interview but i wanted to put this out at the beginning of the video to let you know we had a little bit of a glitch with the video in this one through the recording software that we use or the hardware that we use and this video just turned out a little blurry unfortunately luckily i i recorded like five podcasts in the same week that we recorded phil's and this is the only one that we have the issue with i was able to catch it after this but unfortunately it's a little blurry so keep that in mind as you're watching it and thank you so much if you enjoy it consider subscribing to our youtube channel and that's it let's get into this interview with myself and phil I mean, what is the business that you own? Like, what do you, you know, what do you do? Well, first of all, I, I've been happily married for 46 years, and, and your question is great. <laughs> what business do I own? It's my <laughs> wife and I. Okay. We own. So uh, there you, uh, go. you always make sure I get that out there. <laughs> uh, it, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a diversified company, and it had to become diversified because, um, we back. I joined the company in '78, okay. and it was a um, primarily a, uh, a distributorship for solvent, uh, yeah. just a couple of different types of solvent, like mineral spirits or things that you would use around a garage and a shop. And we, and our main class of trade at that time was uh, a bit industrial, Smith Corona typewriters, okay, uh, uh, beech nut. Down okay. in Canada, Harry, hmm. and Alcoa in, in uh, Messina. Okay. None of those are our accounts now, but mm-hmm. those were our main accounts in 1978. And I joined it. I was a substitute school teacher. Hmm. I graduated from West Hill, like you, yeah. went to Clarkson. And uh, well, I just didn't know quite what I wanted to do in the 70s. <laughs> and uh, my brother, who had 12 years in with Exxon, bought hmm. this company in 75, oh, wow. 76. And, um, you know, I'd always admired my older brother, and he said, hey, I know you're substitute to school teaching, and you've got a truck driver's license. Hmm. How, about, how about trying this out? So I tried it out, and I, I fell in love because it was a small business. And, um, you know, there was, there was just three of us at the time, hmm. and we'd actually declined from in the 60s when the company was 12. But you were selling a product that was being targeted Hmm. by the EPA and by that. You know, we were, where, where do we start to clean up hmm. America? Well, gasoline's pretty hard, politically hard to, <laughs> to, to, to deal with. Mm-hmm. But solvents, not many people use those. Let's target those and make those hazardous waste and hmm. all that thing. So my brother had the foresight to get us into the hazardous waste business. So we hmm. got where we would sell the product, Mm-hmm. We also picked up the waste and brought it back in. And then, mm. then once the DEC realized, hey, we better make these some real restrictions on <laughs> getting a waste permit. Uh, it, and plus, people started to realize, not in my backyard. Yeah. So that permit that we've, we acquired in 1979 has been very valuable. Mm. And so we diversified in the 80s uh, into the waste business as we got that. And then in 87... Uh, the, I came into work one day and said to my brother, Hey, it's very unusual for the United Nations. It's never been done before. And it quite candidly, it's never been done since they unanimously passed the Montreal protocol, which targeted ozone depleting chemicals. Hmm. Our two biggest sellers were ozone depleting chemicals. (laughs) So, uh, you know, the, the, the history of the business is, is that, we we saw the decline, or my brother saw the decline in this business, but bought it because he didn't want to move out of state when Exxon was moving out of state. So he bought it. You know, we could run it for a few years and see what happened. But then he got made the good decision to get us in the waste. Hmm. But now our two biggest sellers have just been targeted. <laughs> so in 93, we started this diversification. Hmm. And... Uh, uh, you know, and the company went from being a 
strictly chemical company selling to dry cleaners and industry uh, and picking up their waste to we started to look at our customer base and said, what else can we sell them? Hmm. And so we got into, since we were picking up dry cleaners waste and just providing them with the cleaning solvent, we got into supplying them bags and hangers and all the stuff that a dry cleaner would use. Well, and then we also started to take the solvents that we had left. We said, how can we add more value to them? We need to get into the equipment rental business. So we got into the equipment rental business where we would just, where you would use the solvent, never mm -hmm. own it, but we would, um, you know, provide you equipment to use it. Hmm. Okay. But there was one problem with that business model. Dry cleaners were falling out of favor because, uh, you know, we started to work from home in the 90s, computerization, and, and people were dressed down Fridays, if you remember that expression. Mm -hmm. Uh, so dry cleaners started to close, and here mm. we are. And But we, instead of running away from it, just like we didn't run away from ozone-depleting chemicals, I, we were the, when the Montreal Protocol was passed in 87, we, and they had like a four-year phase out, mm. five years for manufacture and then distribution, I think we were the last ones probably in this region, I'm talking new, in the Northeast, mm. to still have it. Mm. And so we made a lot of money on a declining market. Wow. So we started to buy up dry cleaning supply companies. <laughs> and so we, you know, we, we were, again, in a declining market. How do you deal with that? Well, you know, we, we embraced it. Hmm. And um, 2002 came, and my wife and I, after 24 years, bought the company from my brother. Wow. And by now we were probably a third of our business was dry cleaning supply, uh, maybe about 20% of it that was waste-related, and then the balance was related to chemicals, hmm. okay? And we probably did at that point, maybe we had done five acquisitions, six acquisitions. We started acquiring businesses in 93. Hmm. Hmm. My brother calls me a serial acquirer. <laughs> uh, that, you know, but, but he went along with it for the first seven or eight years, and yeah. then he decided when he was 60 to want to exit the business. Hmm. And, you know, any, anytime you own something, what do they say about boats? The happiest day, <laughs> two happiest days of your life is when you buy the boat and when you sell it. All right. um, you know, I, I think every business owner, you, you should have an exit plan, mm -hmm. you know, just as individuals. You know, none of us are going to be here forever, so, you know, you create a will, you create trust, you do that. So, you know, as a business owner, you should be always thinking four, five, six, ten years ahead. Mm -hmm. And um, so my brother didn't want to do continue with the expansions because we were getting away from his core business that he liked, that he was comfortable with Exxon. So now I've got us into dry cleaning supply. We're in a service-type mode. So he sold it to us in 2000, to my wife and I in 2002. And I continued the diversification. Um, in 2004, five, I, I got us into uh, uh, ethylene glycol recycling hmm. in a big way. Instead of just picking it up and giving it to somebody else, we st I started, I bought three recycling plants, hmm. small little recycling plants, you know, um, like that, but one was in Buffalo, Sir Rochester, and Syracuse. Hmm. So now we're in the business of recycling glycol through filtration. So as we realized that hmm. the market was changing, then got into distillation, hmm. which is a step up and required us to borrow more money to create, have a special building for it. And, hmm. and that. so um, the, we, in the 2000, in the, after 2000, I bought the, we bought the business in 2002, so by 2012, we're now considered by New York State a manufacturer. Hmm. We still have the distribution function. Dry cleaning faded from about a third of our business to today it's 5%. Hmm. Um, so the company has, has really had to evolve, and that's how we've gone from when I got there, it was 3, down from 12. Now we're around, I'll say about 90 full-time, okay. uh, and then that. Uh, and we started continuing the diversification. We got into uh, 
And one of the best ways you can diversify is mm -hmm. to look at your customer base. Yeah. And you get a flavor if somebody's having maybe some troubles paying their bills or you talk to the owner and they don't have a succession plan. So you as a supplier, mm -hmm. you have some pretty good insight to people. Yeah. And that's how we got into the pool business and water management business, mm. which being in the water management business, all of a sudden we're dealing with restaurants, <laughs> which of course fits in with right. Eat local podcast, yeah. right? Yeah. This, that, you know, <laughs> that, you know, how well, you got this person on your podcast that's <laughs> all about chemicals and ozone depletion. <laughs> there is a reason you asked me here, and it was because you wanted to talk about my thoughts on restaurants and food industry. Yeah, I mean, I you know, on the podcast, uh, yeah, um, I try to be really intentional of, um, uh, this will sound bad for a second, but it, I try to be really intentional on who I have on the podcast and then what I'm going to talk to them about. And I had um, Jim Rusikowski, who owns Chick-fil-A in North Syracuse. I'm familiar with him. We have okay. a mutual friend, Steve Roberts. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I had Jim on, I don't know, three and a half years ago or so on the podcast. And um, I don't know if you're a Saturday Night Live fan. Um, I'm aware of the show. So there was a, a Chris Farley when he was on the show. It was a famous sketch. He's a talk show host, okay. and he has Paul McCartney on this episode. Okay. And the whole bit is Chris Farley sitting there interviewing Paul McCartney and saying, remember that time that you were in the Beatles? And, you know, or he'll go on this long story, and Paul will be like, yep. And Chris Farley will say, that was awesome. You know, like he has nothing planned. Right. And, uh, and that's how my interview with Jimmer went. <laughs> I had, like, I had tried to do at the time, have all this research on guests and you know, write down all these questions. And with Jimmer, there was no information on him out there except for um, this one article from Syracuse.com. Okay. The entire podcast I spent asking him about questions he answered in that Syracuse.com interview. <laughs> <laughs> it was a terrible podcast. But uh, so as, ever since that moment, I just decided, you know, I'm not going to have anything prepared. I'm not going to do any research, have any questions. I have sort of an idea going into it, you know, what I want to talk to the person about. But for the most part, it's just, you know, as you're sitting here telling me about the history of your business and, you know, uh, your, yours and your wife's business, I'm thinking to myself, uh, I'm thinking of 100 questions to ask that maybe a restaurant owner listening could benefit from. Right. Well, here's, here's well, uh, again, we talk about a succession plan, right? Yeah. Owning a business is, there's a commonality. I mean, people ask me, and especially when I bought a pool company, hmm. you know, my wife that says, you don't even, you don't even maintain your own pool. Your wife does. And I say, <laughs> ah, you know, you don't, it, to own a business, you don't have to be necessarily, you should understand how it makes money. Yeah. You should understand the, the core tenets of it, but to think you have to be able to run it, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it, it's, it's a, you know, remember your role is. Yeah. You're an owner. So as I'm transitioning, I mean, I'm 70 years old, and I plan on doing this for at least another 20 years, mm. okay? Yeah. Uh, you know, because when you get to be my age, people, the question they ask is, you know, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? <laughs> and fortunately, my wife likes me out of the house. Um you know, home every night, but you know, mm. likes likes me. Right. They have very live very separate, independent lives, not separate lives. Yeah. But you know, uh, from from a standpoint of ownership, um, you my role. I'm changing from being an owner operator, which maybe some of your restaurateurs have multiple locations. Some of them maybe have single locations. But the challenge is is to is to grow the business. If you want, if you're tired of operating it, but maybe you want to own it and be oversight, um, you know, I want to be able to grow this business, which the next area I'm looking at is creating a food division. Mm, yeah, okay? right. So, uh, you know, our, you know, let's say we have 90, 90 uh, I have 90 coworkers. I don't call them employees. <laughs> Only one of them is full-time in restaurants. Mm. And what is that? That we have about 50 restaurants. Because if you remember, I said I bought a pool company. Yeah. All right. Well, what, what is a pool company? A pool company is water management. Mm -hmm. Okay. You provide equipment to commercial pools. You meter in chemicals. You keep things balanced. All right. So 
We also, because we had the business that I bought, Clean All, they also had a water management program for restaurants. Mm. Okay. We haven't grown it hardly at all since I, I bought, we bought Clean All, oh, I'll say five years ago, seven years ago. Mm. But I've been busy with other things, and you know, now I'm turning my attention to more towards that, that activity. Mm. And by the way, uh, I didn't prepare anything, so we're, we're <laughs> equal on, on preparation. <laughs> uh, so I'm making yeah. it up as we're going along. <laughs> but uh, uh, that's the beauty of basically a live podcast. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, these podcasts, you know, I'm, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, I, I just enjoy having conversations with people, and I think, you know, I've, I've spent, uh, I, I listen to podcasts all the time, and, mm-hmm. you know, when if you sit down and um, and you hear somebody talk, you know, uh, just have a conversation for an hour or more. Um, you kind of get to know the person and a little bit more of who they are and, and kind of how they tick, how they think. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of day, a lot of times nowadays we're just so inclined, you know, with social media to just make snapshot judgments on who people are or, or how they operate or what their business does or all those kind of things. Um, and, uh, and not really know who the person is. And so that's why I kind of, uh, that's why I like not having anything planned and also making the, the conversations, you know, the episodes longer, you mm-hmm. know, an hour or so instead of 15 minutes, because it gives the listener an opportunity to, you know, get to know the people that are talking and, you know, mm-hmm. you, you can really kind of get to know somebody and how they, how they operate. I think after an hour long, not structured or planned right. conversation. Well, and, well, I think I think one of the things to know about my philosophy in business is that it's one of the many philosophies I have is it's easier to sell a customer who already knows you mm. and who you're doing something with. Yeah. So when I sat and said, okay, how, what's another way that I would like to grow this company? Because, you know, um, I think that the food industry is a, a good industry. It's... Uh, certainly uh consistent mm-hmm. uh you know uh there's a certain elasticity of whether you go out or right. to eat or that but it's pretty well ingrained in us that we like to go out to eat yeah it's a it's a very social thing to do you know yeah and, and there's that so i looked at it and said okay we got these 50 restaurants that we aren't doing much with i mean we we service their dish machine mm-hmm. give them some you know pot and pan but you know the it's uh, you know I, I pay for it's pay, it's paying for the person to do the work right. So I met your father, mm-hmm. okay, and your father and I disclose here yeah. went to high school together. Right. Of course, we all went to West Hill. Yeah. And I didn't hang with your father in high school, but I got to know him much better, uh, obviously. This, and he came to me and said, "Phil, I think this mm. is what you can do." And there was a food distributor, Lorenzo's. Went to elementary school with the one of the owners of there. Yeah. So I thought, okay, that's just food distribution. Okay, I understand distribution, markups, routes. That yeah, okay. I, I think we would like to do that. And then lo and behold, once word got out on the street that I'm looking to buy a food distributorship, <laughs> I get a, two more food distributors that want it, want us. So now all of a sudden I've got three distributors that would like to sell to <laughs> us, right? And. And then I thought to myself, gee, what about what about restaurants? Of course, your father is, you know, yeah. like like you, Anthony. He's like connected to the <laughs> food industry, where you know I'm not. Right. And so, you know, all of a sudden, there's three restaurants that want to sell to yeah. us because, and what what I I had to smile when one of them said, "Do you want to see the kitchen?" And I said, "Nah, I don't. For do I have to? <laughs> you know, I mean, because." I really don't know much about restaurants. Yeah. But I understand how to hire and surround myself with people who are smarter than me. Mm. That is the key in in, in, in running a business is mm. you recognize you are never going to be probably the smartest person in the room, so, uh, especially on certain topics and that. You have to just kind of, okay. And you get multiple opinions, mm-hmm. you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes as a leader, you're going to get from people you trust, you're going to get one set and one set and there'll be conflict and you have to sort it out. But I'm really looking forward to creating uh, a food division mm-hmm. at SPS. Uh, and the reason people ask why, and I go, well, first of all, it reduces 
our dependency, we, we, right now I've mentioned two basic activities we do, and we do them by their street number. 1405, which is where we're located on Brewerton Road, that's the mailing address for, that activity is manufacturing, blending, and doing heavy trucking of chemicals and waste. Mm -hmm. Makes 80% of the bit revenue, right? Hmm. You know, um, revenue is like for that part of our business, about 20 million. Hmm. And then the other 4 million is this 838, just down here, which is water management, with pools and, you know, and the restaurant's very small, but, you know, and a little bit of snow plowing and some other stuff there, but it's your manufacturing chemicals for water treatment. That's basically what we do. We have technicians that go out. So I looked at that, that restaurant part of our business yeah. and said, gee, I think because I've met your father, mm -hmm. I think, and your father wants to do this, I think if I back them with credit, you know, uh, we can do this. Yeah. So, you know, I've talked to my banker. Mm -hmm. One of the key things is in any business venture is being properly capitalized, having enough working capital so that if your plans don't work out right, mm -hmm. it doesn't sink the entity that you're actually operating. Right. So, you know, when I got us into the pool business and, and water treatment chemicals and that service business, you know, again, it was not, it's, it's still only 20% of the business. Mm -hmm. But to go back to my thing of why would I want to grow, grow a big food business that I anticipate will be as large or larger potentially than the chemical business mm -hmm. is it reduces the revenue, my exposure to, to that activity that gets done at 1405. Mm -hmm. Okay. Helps grow my act, the activity at 838, the water management. So then I now have three good silos of revenue coming in. Yeah. And the best part is it gives us exposure to a whole different skill set. Hmm. I love the restaurant business that you can get a job there at 14, 15, 16 years old. You don't need a license. Yes, you have to have some training. I know you can't work on certain equipment right. until you're 18, but it's a great entry thing in there. Yeah. And so here I sit with this business that's heavily regulated. You can't drive until you're 21. You've got to pass all these things. Hmm. You got strict drug things, strict hours of service, and all this. So hmm. one part of our business tends to attract the 25 to 40 year old. But if you get in the restaurant business, you can get people at 16, 17, maybe even 14, yeah. you know, to come into that, see who really wants to work, empower them, let them understand the capitalist system, and then you can expose them to the rest of your, of your company. Mm -hmm. So I, I view hmm. this, this getting into restaurants yeah. and getting into the distribution side. Yeah. I, I view this as much a source of good labor mm -hmm. is, 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 is that, you know yeah. I mean? Uh, mm. That's, that's really, so, you know, what's motivating me is the diversity of revenue and the diversity of people and skill sets that will, will come with it. Yeah. And, you know, as, it, as we grow, then, you know, right now our largest customer uh, is about 6% of our sales. Mm. And I'd like to get that down not that I want that customer to go right. away. I'd like to get that down to no customers over 3%. Hmm. So, wow. there's, so there's a lot of motivating yeah. things. Um, and also, I, just, I also just like <laughs> a mentoring younger people mm -hmm. or younger you're mentoring middle managers and, you know, and, and empowering people. Yeah. Because my role is I transition from being an owner operator to an owner. I tell people I have three things to do. I will have to be available for opportunities. I'd like to appear in this podcast. Mm -hmm. You asked me yesterday. <laughs> Can you show up today or tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, okay. I keep my schedule fairly open because as I'm transitioning, I don't have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if I delegate things off and keep delegating. So my first thing is to be available for opportunities and to listen, mm. even though I'm doing most of the talking here. <laughs> Second thing is capitalization. 
I've got to make sure that uh, Citibank is who I bank with. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got to make sure that they're satisfied with uh, my my earning the earnings of the company, the debt service that we're carrying, and um, you mm -hmm. know that there's collateral behind things, and that I have a good, good you know the the history of a business that I would like to acquire, or things such as that. So. The, uh, be available for op opportunity, mm -hmm. capitalization, and then the most important thing, culture. Mm -hmm. Culture is so important with a company. And I wouldn't want to, I've worked at places um, that, you know, back in my 20s, um, you know, that it was an ugly culture to work at. And I, if I didn't enjoy the culture and I will say, I, my wife has given me many, uh, many <laughs> useful things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of her great sayings is to get control, you've got to give up control. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you're raising children right. or that, you, you know, you, if you try to micromanage something, are you really controlling it? And so you've got to give up control to get control. And the other thing she, my wife likes to say is the captain or the, the head of the organization sets the tone. Mm -hmm. So I make sure, I remember this from when I was a substitute school teacher, uh, I made sure that, you know, I realize it's a performance when I walk, in, when I walk into any, any place of the company. Yeah. And I realize I'm not acting, but it's who I really am. Right. I, you know, I mean, uh, the best story I can tell about <laughs> that I knew I had the right culture about 25 years ago. I don't even know whether I owned the company or my brother <laughs> owned it. But I'm walking into one of the warehouses, and there's three people. Can't remember the – that doesn't matter. There's three male drivers over there, and they see me coming. And they go, Phil, Phil, stay over there. Do inventory. <laughs> Does something. All right, so I stop. Mm -hmm. So I, obviously I was close enough to them that they had to shout for me to stop coming. All right. So then they go back, and they finished – whatever story they were telling. Mm -hmm. You know, it was maybe 30, 45 seconds. I don't remember. But then they go, okay, Phil, come on over. What that told me was is that they were either gossiping about somebody else, something that I shouldn't hear mm -hmm. as either the number two guy, which I was my brother's number two for 24 years. Mm -hmm. you know, I took care of things. Or I was not with that. They were gossiping about somebody else that I wouldn't be pleased. Yeah. Or they were telling an off-color story, mm -hmm. and they were going to use some, you know, foul <laughs> language, which I can't, I'm not supposed to hear. Right. Because you know, I'm. I always say this: I'm a G-rated guy <laughs> in an R-rated world. Mm -hmm. So have I sworn? <laughs> yes, of course. You know, I'm not. I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not. You know, I'm not the. Uh, you know, I'm not yeah. the Pope. But you know. Um, you know, I, I, I recognize, and that's where I go back to what I want to maintain. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring that to any organization that I come to. I want that kind of culture that people should, there's enough stress in this world, you shouldn't stress about coming to work. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, I tell people, you can't make a mistake as big as I've made. Mm -hmm. A, I've been here longer. So I've made a lot more mistakes. And because of the position I'm in, I can make some really doozy ones. I mean, you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollar mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> you can make mistakes, but don't be afraid to admit it. And that, you know, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, I I'm very reluctant mm -hmm. to terminate people. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. And and the staff, the managers know that I like to do that. And one of the oh I mentioned another great thing yeah. about getting into the restaurant business is that it gives me not only people coming in, people existing that I have, mm -hmm. I can move them into the restaurant business. So let's say you're really not cut out for production and chemicals and that. Yeah. But I go, you know, I think you'd be a great waitress, waiter. I think you'd be great as, as a line cook. Mm -hmm. And as I've, as I've announced to the team, that we're going to have a restaurant division, yeah. and it's going to be greater than $10 million. Mm. You know, we'll get there. I go, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be great because we can now move people. 
And we, I've already done that with Lorenzo's. I've mentioned that, you know, we're, we're getting pretty close on a deal with them. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got drivers that go over and drive for Lorenzo's hmm. at warehouse people that, Hey, you know, it was, we're, we're already starting this, this cross pollinization. Hmm. And, you know, I'd love to go out and grab fish out in Boston because we have a facility in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Okay. So I could picture us taking a tractor trailer out to Boston, hmm. dro- or the, the New England area, dropping, you know, case goods of things that we have. Yeah. Then, you know, go in, pick up fish, come back, hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, we operate 60 trucks right now, so wow. why add, what's, what's adding one to, to bring fish from the new england and take stuff out hmm. you know that's why i i, I really am excited about restaurants yeah and the food industry yeah i mean it's uh it's a definitely an exciting industry it's um in our area it's um i mean syracuse and central new york is is behind the times and you know a lot of different ways uh from and one of those ways is without a doubt food and the restaurant food service industry um, from other cities, and um, you know, during the pandemic, why I, do you why do you say that? Excuse me for interrupting. Well, like I just launched, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to partner with you know Chuck and Nick from Limp Lizard, and we started Three One Fried, okay. which is um, a, a restaurant that focuses on takeout and delivery only. We operate inside of the Limp Lizard in North Syracuse. Okay. Um, but, and I've had the idea for the name of this restaurant for like four or five years. Um, and then, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you the story to make the point. So, uh, like I said, I'm friends with Nick and Chuck and, and um, uh, really just friends with Nick. But, uh, and I did some social media, like, you know, pictures and content creation for him. Anyways. Nick said, hey, our North Syracuse location, you know, could be a lot busier. Um, uh, and I had, I don't know if you're familiar with what a ghost kitchen is. Uh, I think, let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. Good idea. It, it's where you don't have any, um, you don't have anybody seating there and it's kind of just only a takeout thing. Yes. So sort of. It's basically a, a real ghost kitchen would be. Delivery only. Yeah. And let's say this studio was a ghost kitchen. You would have four kitchens in this space. It's just kitchens. Yeah. Four different restaurants. And you would just have Grubhub and DoorDash drivers come up and get food and deliver it. Right. Okay. So, and that's it. Yep. So, Nick, uh, or so two years ago, there was a ghost kitchen uh, in Syracuse that opened called Mad Burger, just up here in the old O days. And the owner of that restaurant had hired me to help her build the, like, start the brand, come up with a name, do the logo, do the content creation and the social media for her. She was only open for two weeks, and then she shut down permanently (laughs) because of staffing issues. Um, She didn't have enough capital. uh, Well, actually, so hers is kind of a similar, you know, not really, but she owns uh, the Brasserie in Camillus. Okay. And so they had had, like, a ghost kitchen doesn't need a big staff. You need, like, two people, depending on what you're cooking. But, um one of her people, she wound up moving back over to the Brazzer. Or she not back over. Right. She wound up moving to the Brazzer because they all of a sudden needed help. Right. And the other person just quit. And, you know, plus then she's pulled away from her main restaurant right. that's doing a shit ton more, you right. know, excuse my language, than the okay. Mad Burger, right? Yes. So they were just, so after two weeks, she just shut it down. Okay. Um, I tried she to. She didn't have a lot invested, basically. No. Um, because she already had the building and the kitchen and she had to get a couple things. And right. I wanted to, I really wanted that thing to stay open. And, uh, we tried to get, you know, we were offering chefs get, we're out of work, $25 an hour cash and they were turning it down. Uh, cause they were, you know, that was like the height of unemployment. Um, but anyway, so I had helped that. So Nick was saying, we're kind of slow up here. Let's come up with a ghost kitchen and do it together. So after, you know, a month or so of thinking ideas, I said, oh, I've had this idea for 3-1 Fried, a fried chicken restaurant. We could do that, but just fried chicken sandwiches because it was going to focus on takeout and delivery. And it's less equipment to just do sandwiches than bone-in fried chicken. So we spent about four months kind of solidifying the name and the logo and coming up with the recipes and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then about a month of putting the rest of it together and... Uh, yeah. So 
ghost kitchen. Not really. We're not really a ghost kitchen because you get takeout and you can del- you can you can sit down. So we're just kind of a restaurant inside of a restaurant. But um, limited menu. Only we only have eight items on the whole menu. Okay. Um, uh, only chicken, and uh, the fact that we're really like a fried chicken sandwich, gourmet fried chicken sandwich only restaurant. That concept has existed in popularity in New York City and on the West Coast for the last six, seven years. So it's, you were the first one here. How's it going? It's going good. Yeah, we just finished our first month. We opened April 1st. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean when I say in the food scene, we're kind of behind the times. I understand now. Because the, that concept hit pop very big in Buffalo and Rochester, because I work with the restaurants that were doing it out there, oh, two or three years ago. And then we were the first to really ever do it, and eh, so fly was. But if we're, you were me, would you get into the restaurant business if, with my back with my background? I don't know. I don't know enough about the. I don't know enough about all the ways to make money in the restaurant industry. Okay. You know, like so, um, and that's where, like, I'm extremely fortunate to be partnered with Nick and Chuck, who have been doing this massively popular restaurant for forty right. years, because. I know talking to experienced restaurant people, mm-hmm. restaurant owners, that their philosophy is like, um, is pennies matter is a real big deal. You know, if you can save like, hey, listen, you can save two cents on a takeout container. If you buy it this way, go buy it that way. Even though it's only saving you two cents a container, make sure you save it. Um, and then I also asked, because I interviewed Adam Weitzman on a podcast, mm-hmm. and I asked him what's information, like, you're going to give a restaurant owner, new restaurant owner, any advice, what is it going to be? And his advice was monitor your food cost and manage your food waste. So those are the things that coming from like a marketing background, I would never be worried about Mm -hmm. a few cents on a product. I'd be like, I don't care. It's going to look better. The customer experience, whatever, we're going to do it. We're going to spend the extra money th- on this one. Right. And the old school successful restaurant owners were like, no, if we're going to save a penny, we're going to save a penny. Okay. So. Um, I'll rely, I'll rely on your father. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not worried, you know, it's, I mean, I, we don't need, I don't need a, I don't need a profit to hit this bottom line, but. Right. Um, I mean, I've got to be certainly conscious of revenue and cost because I'll be borrowing money. But, yeah. you know, for, for me, I think it just enhances because a lot of the things that I've done, I've actually purchased 26 businesses hmm. since 1993. Wow. Now, totaling, they're, all, they're small. Hmm. Total is $2.2 million, Wow. Okay. Four of them I bought for a dollar <laughs> because... Uh, you know, they were in such dire straits. Hmm. I'm talking, and usually I always use, if I let somebody get into us for credit, Mm -hmm. I always say, well, maybe I want to buy that business. They already owe us $10,000. It's a reason to pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, if you can't pay me $10,000, you probably can't pay the next person $10,000. What do you you plan to do with your life for the next three years? You know, you're struggling. Well, Hmm. you know, and then I go, you know, usually it's an ally. It's, remember, it's an existing customer that I'm talking to. So they're already doing something that All right. that we're that I'm interested in. You know, that's how I've that's how I bought four businesses for a dollar. That's you know, wild. And then, uh, but the other ones, I think the largest one we did was four hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. So, uh, but it's you know it's continually adding on, adding on. Yeah. And you know, I view this food division as it's going to be it's going to be. Distribution, mm-hmm. already do that. Trucks, yeah. warehousing, people, sales, organization, you know, all that. And, yeah. You know, but I'm buying existing businesses which have a track record and a balance sheet. Yeah. I will say one thing, like you mentioned, culture is really big in your business now. Yeah. Yes. That's something that does not exist in most food businesses, uh, whether it's at the restaurant or it's at the you know supplier level in Syracuse. It's it's across the board, and a lot of these food suppliers, um, you know, uh, you know, paper companies, food, you know, all these. There's very little cult like cor- company culture that exists in every area of the okay. business. Well, I, I will bring. 
Uh, and that's why the three restaurateurs mm-hmm. and why the three distributors yeah. want to sell right, to, sure. to, yeah. to SPS. Because they've met me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I come across, hopefully I'm coming across in this podcast, <laughs> as, you know, someone that, you know, you would, wouldn't mind living next door to. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, throw my trash on your... Uh, <laughs> on your lawn. In fact, I picked up some trash on the way walking down. <laughs> Since we only live, yeah. or you told me where this podcast was going to be, I said, Anthony, <laughs> I'm going to walk there. It's only uh, two blocks from my, off- my yeah. corporate office. And I picked up some trash, nice. threw it in there. So, you know, I mean, that's just who I am. And I recognize that they say, well, we've got to save two cents. Yeah, I, I'm going to subject you to my... Oh, you know, this, uh, and your listeners to this, mm-hmm. t- this story I tell you of why price mm-hmm. is overrated. Okay. okay. There's four things that I think go into a purchasing decision, mm-hmm. whether it be your, what restaurant you're going to choose, what supplier, whatever. First is, do you like the person, the brand or something? Yeah. If you don't like the person, you don't like the brand for whatever reason, they can't give it to you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just things you just won't do. Right. Because I don't like that person, don't like that brand. So that's the first thing you got to overcome. Second thing is the people that represent it, you know, are, are they somebody, you know, how well, uh, you know, is it a pro? Excuse me. The second thing is, the second thing is, do they have something you want? Mm-hmm. Okay. I have met a lot of nice people. But they might want to sell me opera tickets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so although I like them and they they got past that first hurdle, <laughs> I, I'm just not a big fan of serious opera. Light opera, Gilbert, <laughs> Osul- Gilbert <laughs> Sullivan, yes, I am. Third thing is how well do they how well does do they add value to it? Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, maybe I maybe I need a car or whatever. And then the fourth thing is, oh, what's the price? Now I'll give you the reason why. Hmm. That my four prices fourth in importance versus the first. When I lived in Westvale, I had to drive by the most commoditized product we all buy, gasoline. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you would think, well, gasoline, my goodness, uh, it has to be pretty much within a percent or two, right? Pennies matter. Yeah. No, it doesn't. The reason being is, I went by three Sunoco gas stations driving when I lived in Westvale Mm -hmm. from Maddydale to Westvale. I went by three Sunoco gas stations. And they would have a price variation, 7 to 12%. Mm -hmm. I'm talking the same grade. I'm talking all self-serve. So there's there's not a lot. And I said to myself, and I'll tell you why there why they had a spread. If I was if I was in a hurry, mm-hmm. I would stop at the highest price one because that was on Wolf Street. I could get in, out, and that I didn't care. I needed to get home in time for dinner. Yeah. So I'm gonna that would be if I was coming to work at four or five in the morning. The only one that was open was the one on Getta Street and and uh, that. So I'd stop in there and that would get the best price. But if also I wanted to shop sometimes near my house. I'd stop there. So here I'm dealing with a commodity, mm-hmm. no variation in quality, no variation in service. Right. Yet you have a spread of seven to twelve percent. Yeah. So then you take something that is personal as a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Do you think most consumers look at whether it's eight ninety five for the fish sandwich or ten ninety five? If they're coming to your restaurant, yeah. They're coming because they liked the experience they had before, or they want a new experience. Right. Then they then who then you're selling them something. Presumably they walk in that they want. You know, right. I'm, I'm not a sushi fan, so I don't go to sushi restaurants. Mm-hmm. But you meet that, and then how well do you add value to their experience? Yeah, price. Come on. Yeah, especially if you're if you're in a restaurant that is a bit more upscale right. than, not that I'm, than, than, than let's say, and, you know, I mean, McDonald's is nice, but you would never take anybody there for a business dinner. Mm-hmm. You would never take 
a significant other to say, hey, for your birthday, we're going to McDonald's. Yeah. You know, you might get a, you know, a <laughs> dirty look. You know, I mean, McDonald's is great. I've right. shopped there. Yeah, for sure. I also, as long as we're on the subject of McDonald's, I want to, I want to bring up the, comp- the sort of theory of nobody has any competitors. And I'll explain why. Okay, You're, I, you, I love that you rolled your eyes. Okay? I was, th- I was, I wasn't rolling. I was more looking. When I think, I'm, I usually look up. At, you know, so that's what oh. I was doing. Not that I was rolling. Okay, well, I, yeah. I enjoyed the expression. I, I'm glad you're listening to me. I, what, yeah. I'm, what my fear is yeah. is that you're going to suddenly I'm going to look up and you're going to be. Yeah, no, asleep. Not at all. <laughs> they always say if you get in a room with Phil, make sure you get the closest to the door. He could he could turn any interview into a hostage situation. Uh, so, anyways, think about Burger King and McDonald's. Mm-hmm. Are they competitors? Yeah. No. Here's why. <laughs> I'm a consumer. Yeah. All right. I love fish. Uh-huh. If I want to have a little extra cheese, maybe a little. I'm, I'm feeling a little uh, bold today. Yeah. I'll go to my, not, it's a, not a fish sandwich, it's a filet of fish. Right. And what does it come with? A slice of cheese. Mm-hmm. If I'm feeling I should be a little healthier, maybe, mm-hmm. I go to Burger King. Why? No slice of cheese. Mm-hmm. What do they call it? BK Big Fish. Mm-hmm. And what do you get on it? Lettuce, tomato. Yeah. Okay. So from the standpoint mm-hmm. of me as a consumer, their choices. So I tell everybody I deal with, and in <clears throat> and you talk about there's a great culture in the chemical industry, in the waste industry. Yeah. 50% of my 20 million sales that I mentioned in mm-hmm. that industry that I sell, 10 million of it goes to resellers. Hmm. I mean, I'm dealing with people who take our products and stuff and resell it. Yeah. Okay? And, you know, I have a good street price, a good direct price, so I sell them. Sometimes I get, I get a quote, a, just a reseller will take some piece of direct business away from me. Mm-hmm. It happens. But why did they take it from me? Because it was another choice. Mm-hmm. It was maybe they liked their driver. Maybe they liked their schedule. Maybe they bundled some other things in there. Yeah. So th- so to, mm-hmm. to every business owner, yeah. you are just a choice in the great capitalist marketplace. Mm-hmm. Don't think of your neighbor down the street that does somewhat what you do right? as a competitor, it's a choice. Yeah. I don't think, you know, I will say, I mean, working, I, I see this more so in the local brewery scene than I do in any other food industry in Syracuse. Yeah. Um, some somewhat downtown, but the local breweries, you know, they all collaborate together on beers um, that they make, that they co-brew together. Um, you know, 20 of them just got together to release a glory for Ukraine beer that was a recipe from a brewery in in Ukraine who during the, when the war broke out, stopped making beer and started making uh, Molotov cocktails. Okay. So they released their like core recipes out to breweries across the world and said, we're not making them because we're making Molotov cocktails. If you want to make them, here's the recipe. So 20 local breweries in central New York all got together to make a beer, to sell it, and they're donating all the proceeds back to the Ukraine. Um, But breweries get together and collab on stuff all the time. And some restaurants in downtown will, you know, they'll call each other up. Hey, I ran out of flour. Can I come get it? You know, and they'll share stuff like that constantly. So there is a lot of that kind of back and forth. There's not too much um, in the local scene. Um hey, I've got to compete against you, you know, sort of a thing. Like, I'm, I've got to try and find a way to get your customers. Most of them, even though, you know, they're all trying to make a living, they still, you know, help each other out and work right. together. And, and the right. thing is, you know, when I, I, my wife and I go out every Friday night, uh-huh. okay, to a restaurant, I mean, I would hate to think that I can only go to one restaurant right. 52 times a year, mm-hmm. you know. So to me, it's... It's a choice. Yeah. And, you know, I recognize that, you know, I, I, I mean, I, 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 there's a chemical distributor up in Watertown called Slack Chemical. And I was talking to, I don't talk to him that often, but I was talking to uh, the sales manager and he, and I wanted to wish the owner a happy 89th birthday. Mm-hmm. And I told him he's my guiding light. 
<laughs> you know, because I'm 19 years younger than him, right? So I watch Bob and I do that. And he says, well, Phil, even though I know we're competitors, and then, of course, I stuck him with the Burger King McDonald's <laughs> story. You know, and he says, yeah, I never thought of it like that. Yeah. And realistically, when I heard, you know, not to get too political with you, but yeah. uh, when I heard our president one time say, and I won't say which president, because they both <laughs> said it, both, both sides of the said it, China is having our lunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, no. We're buying from China because yeah. it's it seems to be cost competitive, okay? But we have things going back and forth, mm -hmm. well, trade imbalance. But you know, I, I, my 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 opinion is is that if you have free markets and we're free to buy from them, not buy from them, you know, it's not a case of a zero sum game, right? You know, and um, you know, I just I just feel that. You know, I, I'm able to get. A, I, I love our capitalist system. Yeah, and it and, and it allows. It's allowed me to have a great life, and it's allowed my coworkers to have a great life. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy. I enjoy that they're free to come and go from employment with us. Mm -hmm. And I enjoy that you know, my customers are free to come and go. Yeah, I have very few contracts. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, there is there. I, I forget. Well, actually, I just found out recently. I guess the. The average, I'm assuming this is correct, I haven't researched it, the average Chick-fil-A location does $8 million a year in revenue. Okay. Um, and they're, they're famous for, um, you know, they say, you know, if a customer walks into McDonald's, right. and by the way, that, that, that average revenue for a Chick-fil-A is like twice as much as the next McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's right. or Taco Bell. But there, if a customer walks into a McDonald's, and the employee is trained to envision the customer having a $20 bill on their forehead. They're trained to say, how much of that $20 can I get from the customer? Can I okay. upsize them? Can I get them to buy an ice cream or whatever the case is, right? right? At Chick-fil-A, they're trained to, the staff are trained to see the customer with the $20 on their forehead and say, how much value can I give them for that $20? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's a company that has really just change the way that like fast food operates you know i mean they just make it convenient for their customers on you know every every possibility to uh to get their food and they do a ton of business from it so right well they've got a they've got a brand and that which, is, yeah. which they're doing a great job with right so. for sure well, I think we've been we've been about an hour because I see your watch. Yeah, I, I want to ask you one question though. Oh, sure. Um, and so the question is, uh, if you're buying a business, okay, yes. you're you're getting ready to buy business X, and it's a million dollars, let's say. Yes. Um, uh, is there a breakdown that you look at where you say, okay, this is going to cost me a million dollars, and I'm not going to recoup that for X years? Is there, like, when you're looking at buying something, are you saying, okay, I need to be able to pay that back from their revenue, for, from their profits within two years, within 10 years, that makes that helps you make the decision and what business you're going to buy or not buy? Well, uh, you know, there, there's many factors. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm buying Lorenzo's because, you know, they, they are profitable, but mm -hmm. it's I'm not – sitting there saying, I'm going to put a rule of 72, which means you double your money in 10 years, uh, seven years, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I look at, I look at ancillary things, okay. you know, in other words, what staff, like this one food distributorship that I'm looking at, mm -hmm. I'm going to employ the owner as the environmental health and safety. <laughs> uh, she, she has a great background in environmental health and safety and has only been in the food industry for three years and wants to get out. Mm. So to me, I'm not, I'm not, that is going to be less, and it's a relatively small business, you know, it's, yeah. I'll, end, I'll end up picking up, you know, two employees. Yeah. Okay. But with the, but the side benefit for that is there, uh, but the purchase price of what we're going to establish. I mean, when you're buying a restaurant, my experience is, and I've only tried, I'm only trying to buy three of them. Um, I haven't closed on any of them yet, but I'm in negotiations. Uh, they're more a real estate deal. They're as much a real estate deal as they are a business. Okay. Okay. So you have that kind of comfort and protection that, okay, if it doesn't work out. But, you know, I generally, I think, you know, as, as an owner, if I'm sitting across from you and you were selling it, I also like to say, tell me why this is a good deal for me to buy your business. And if we had to switch seats, you know, mm. if you can't explain to me why 
your price is fair or right. your price has good value with it. I mean, you read the word fair. Um, you know, then, gee, I probably shouldn't do this. Hmm. But, you, you know, I, I look at maybe, you know, I mean, you know, you should be able to get your money back in seven years. Okay. You know, yeah. I, I would say that, you know, that's a 10% rate of return. Yeah. You know, but most businesses would probably want to say, uh, you want to get it back in three, three and a half, which would be 20% rate of return. Hmm. So, uh, but I, because usually anything I buy, yeah. there's, there's side benefits to it that, hmm. you know, that's why I've done 26, yeah. whatever the number was. I think I, I've, I've lost, I have it, I have it in a chart. I can't remember <laughs> if it's 24 or 26, but I know the 2.2 is. That's why. Yeah. Well, Phil, thank you so much for coming down. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it, Anthony. And we'll look forward to seeing everything that, uh, you know, happens and we'll have you down again when, uh, well, after I get, after you have me down about uh, the end of the year, I'll still, I'll give you an update. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks.